80 years ago today, stocks plunged in what was the most devastating equities collapse in U.S. history. And on this anniversary of the 1929 crash, we learned that the economy expanded for the first time in one year. James Galbraith, the professor at the University of Texas, joins us to discuss today's GDP report. Professor Galbraith is also the author of The Predator State, which is about the failure of the free market and the government's effort to regulate it. Mr. Galbraith, Professor Galbraith, many thanks. Thank it's you for pleasure. joining us. You. you know, I'd like to start with the GDP report and, and put to you the question I asked Austin Goolsby, the White House advisor. Should the 15 million Americans out of work take any pause, be at the very least optimistic about this better than expected economic, uh, I'm sorry, GDP reading, that it will mean that they could get rehired sooner rather than later. It is not going to make any material difference to most of them anytime soon. You will need to have six strong months of growth, two full quarters, uh, I think, before you begin to see employers looking to take people off of, the, of an unemployment. And the problem is, Although we were certainly getting a bounce right now, partly from inventories and partly from cash for clunkers, it's not clear that six months from now they, uh, we will still be moving upward strongly. Among the research today, the economist Chris Rupke pointed out that business capital spending stopped declining, a less bad indicator perhaps. So if companies are starting to add equipment again, could that mean that they would add workers as well? Eventually they will have to. In the short run, though, they can get a great deal of uh, additional output from their existing workforces. And so long as the climate is uncertain, that's what we'll do. So we'll see these very strong productivity numbers, which are very bad news for people who are standing in line waiting for jobs. So we've got another job. I guess the October jobs report then hits us next week. Um, the prediction is 10 percent unemployment before the end of the year. So the results of today's GDP finding won't cross over. That won't be evident in the in the jobs report for October that we'll see next week. I think that's right. And I think what you'll see is that 10 percent number will linger because even and when there is some progress on uh, job creation, people will start moving back into the labor force who've dropped out of it. And so we're going to see a very ugly 10 percent unemployment number for quite some time unless additional steps are taken. What kind of additional steps? Well, I think you need to do two things. I think you need to help people who uh, have lost their jobs and who are ready to retire make it economically possible for them to leave the labor force permanently. And you need to be creating jobs, particularly for younger people who, uh, for the moment, can't find anything. Breaking down today's GDP report further, we also learned perhaps a surprise was that housing construction added one half of one percent to GDP as opposed to subtracting from it, which had been the case right for the last three years. So can this trend continue, especially now that the tax credit has been expended, the first time homebuyers tax credit? Well, I think we're seeing the effect of that first time homebuyers tax credit. And I uh, so therefore I would be that would be nice if it continued. Uh, that said, housing construction levels are still very low even with this bounce. So uh, I think the basic problem in housing is that there's still very large oversupply, still a major foreclosure problem. Uh, and uh, you know, you, never, you can't be sure what's going to happen, but I would not be optimistic for a full recovery in housing in the foreseeable future. Yet the fact that it's not taking away from GDP, isn't that just something to hold on to as, as a positive sign? It's better, it's better than the reverse, for sure. Uh, Again, another part of the report mm -hmm. today. Economists have been characterizing the recoveries as not being consumer driven. Yet, even if you take out the cash for clunkers as well as the, um, yeah, the cash for clunkers stimulus and some of the mm -hmm. other, you still had a 1% increase uh, in consumer spending. So as usual, are we, are we writing off the American spender too soon in a recovery, which is, was kind of the case back in 2001? Well, it's clear that incomes fell much less than employment and production did, and that's what drove the inventory cycle, uh, and that's helping to sustain consumption now. Uh, that's largely the result of a combination of automatic stabilizers, uh, very large budget deficits that kicked in beginning at the start of the year, plus the stimulus package. Uh, and all of that is helpful. The problem is uh, to sustain this kind of consumption-driven growth over the long term, people have to be able to borrow, as they did in the last boom, against something against and home equity has been the thing uh, and the uh, until you have some resolution of the home equity uh, slump of the collapse of house values it's very hard for me to see how the housing sector comes back in a strong and sustainable way 
And that's where I, I think the problem here is, yes, we are going to see a short-term bounce. That's clearly been in the, baked in the cake for, for months, and people have been predicting it. But it would not be right to infer from that that we're on the track to a sustained expansion. Uh, and particularly as the stimulus package runs out, some of the things that have been giving us uh, the growth in this last quarter may start fading from the picture. And there's an interesting dichotomy unfolding in that large business, large financial firms in particular, are having an easier time with credit as opposed to the small business. In fact, the president just said today that the key to job growth is small business and improvements there. The key to economic recovery is a strategy that works on the broad population that includes small business, that includes job creation, and it includes dealing with housing. Uh, once you deal with those issues, the financial problems will tend to resolve themselves. If you fail to deal with those issues, the financial problems are just going to remain there and they're going to continue to drag up the system. Is Washington on the right track with some of this regulatory reform? I think some of the regulatory reform is going to be helpful. I think it should be much stronger. I think we do need a revival of Glass-Steagall, separating commercial from investment banking. Uh, I don't think the Federal Reserve is the right agency to take the lead on systemic uh, risk regulation. I don't think that has the institutional priority of that agency. Uh, but yes, there should be very strong move to financial reform. And the financial sector should really get out of the way of this. I and mean, we should not be tolerating banks who have just been, bailing, been bailed out lobbying against financial reform. Picking up on the Fed, Austin Goolsby kind of mm -hmm. dodged the White House advisor, my question about the exit strategy. And, you know, he said, look, it's not even time to, to start thinking about that. But I think a, a legitimate concern with the Fed meeting next week is whether or not they're scrambling to put the go button on with the exit strategy. I mean, with the GDP report today, do we really need this trillion dollars in excess reserves? I think they're going to have a very hard time implementing an exit strategy. I think Austin's exactly right on this. Uh, we are really going to be stuck with this until... Uh, until, as I said, the underlying structural problems have been resolved. We're not, I think, close to that. Uh, and I think, you know, the, given some of the way, the, the strategic choice that was chosen, taken in the financial sector to prop up the major institutions and to paper over uh, their toxic assets rather than to resolve them, we're going to be much longer in getting to an exit strategy than we would have otherwise. And they're going to have, the Fed is going to have to raise interest rates next year. Don't you agree? Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, pass judgment on that too soon. Really? Uh, no. Not with inflation brewing? I don't think we're going to see an inflation. I, uh, the risk that we have on the inflation front is basically commodity price increases fueled by what's effectively the carry trade, low, low interest rates. Uh,